right, hey, good morning, Northwoods. My name's Hope, I'm here with Janine. Hello. And we are so excited to be here with you this Sunday. Um, we would just love for you to jump into the chat, say hi, we'd love to know where you are watching from. And I think Wicket maybe will join the chat this morning. We'll have to see. <laughs> well, you know what? We want to know that you're here. It's so important to us, for us to know who's joining us today. So open up your Northwoods app and fill out the connection card. Mm -hmm. And while you're there, there is a space for you to leave a prayer request. Let us know how we can be praying for you. We have an incredible prayer ministry and their passion is to pray, pray for you. So give us your prayer requests and let us go to bat with you on the things you're asking God for in your life. Yeah, that's an awesome way to request prayer and get connected with the team. And also, if you are joining us on Northwoods Online, we have prayer team members available in the chat. So you can click live prayer and someone will be there to pray with you. So I just love our prayer team. They do an awesome job and you know they're just here to serve and pray for people. It's great. Yep. But Janine, before we get started, I do have a question for you. How do you feel about clutter? Oh, uh, gosh, I hate clutter, but... Like everyone else, we live in our home and I do have to deal with clutter here and there. The pile of mail that you said never seem to get rid of and every time you do it piles up again. And uh, But yeah, I wish I could figure it out, but I do struggle with clutter. Yeah, same. I can relate to the mail. I feel like around Christmas, it's extra around mm -hmm. our house with even just like the boxes of decorations and the gifts that I'm trying to wrap. We're just kind of a mess right now. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't think that Pastor Cal is going to be giving us home organization tips today. Darn. However, he is giving a message called Clean Out the Clutter, and I am excited for what that's going to be about as he continues our series, Joy to the World, which has really been great so far this year. Yes, I'm excited to hear what he's going to have to say, too. Well, you know what? We are starting off with child blessings on a couple of our campuses such a sweet, sweet time. So we are now going to hand this off to our pastors. Here, shout if you're glad to be in the house today. Great to see you guys. And uh, one of our joys today, you know, we were all locked down back in May during Mother's Day when we normally do baby dedications. And so we're glad to be able to present to you a little bit of our church growth since then. And uh, the joy we have to dedicate these little ones, I'm so glad that we can do that today. We do this really. Uh, as we see Jesus moving throughout the scriptures and laying his hands on the little ones to what? Bless them. Moms and dads understand one of the most powerful things you can do for your children is lay hands on them and bless them in the name of the Lord. There is power in that blessing. And uh, the disciples are trying to keep uh, the kids away from Jesus, you know, and Jesus sees that and says, no, 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 let the little ones come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And we also do this as well to acknowledge that we believe the family is the basic building block of all culture. And uh, we want to see families strengthened today. And so Northwood is all about helping to strengthen families. We're grateful for these little gifts that they hold today. And uh, we're going to dedicate them to the Lord now. So our very first one, into the Sutton family. So another little worship leader. This is... Camille, and that name means perfection. That's a pretty good name. And uh, we think about the fact that we have become the righteousness of Christ, his perfection is upon us. And Camille, I pray that your little life not only will shine forth the perfections of the Lord, but you'll, you'll be a reminder that in him we are in a position of perfection. So little Camille, we pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Bless you, buddy. I get the privilege today 
of having my two little granddaughters on stage and my first little grandson. Here you go. I waited a long time for this little guy. His name is Aaron, and if my mom, my mom and dad are one generation, I'm the second generation. Jonathan is the third generation. This is the first grandson in our fourth generation, and, uh, and the only. We had been praying about this for a long, long time, and someday I'm going to tell you the story because this little guy is a sweet answer to prayer. And Aaron, that means like an exalted mountain. And they named him Aaron as well because we're praying this guy just like that priestly line. Aaron was Moses' brother, part of the priesthood. We're praying this little guy will stand and proclaim the gospel uh, all his life. So Aaron, we present you to the Lord today. We're so grateful for you. We pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace, even as he gives you lungs. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you. And this is Bria. Hi, Bria. Bria means noble or exalted. And Bria, we pray that your name will be reflected in your life, that you, you will be one whose life exalts the Lord Jesus Christ that the words of your mouth and the desire of your heart will exalt the Lord with me. And so we pray you'll come to know him very early in your life and that you'll go on to be one whose life truly does exalt the Lord. So Bria, we, we thank the Lord for you. We pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now you know, don't you? <laughs> Jesse, you come to me? No, nope, he's going to cling to mama. That's okay. <laughs> Jesse. And that one, listen, the Lord exists. And so your very name proclaims the truth that God exists. Jesse, we pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, young man. God bless you. And this one is Sophia. Come here. Come here, little baby. And we owe it Sophia. Wisdom, 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 wisdom. And the Bible talks about us being filled with wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Not just natural wisdom. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit. I just read a great book about spiritual intelligence which is listening to hear the words of the Lord and being filled with spiritual wisdom. And so we pray, Sophia, that your life will reflect that, that you'll be one who listens to the Spirit of God. Your heart will be drawn to Jesus very early, and you'll go on to do mighty works in his name. We pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. And this guy is Jude. Come here, Jude. Some of you remember that song. Hey, Jude. <laughs> Jude means praise. It was one of the sons of Jacob, Judah, right? Where was the Messiah from? The tribe of Judah. Judah's all about the praise that belongs to the Lord. And we pray that very early in your life you'll come to know Jesus and that your life will be all about giving him praise, that praise will come to him, and through your life, others will come to know him as well. So Jude, we pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine up on you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's stand together. Will you, if you feel okay doing this, just extend your hands like you're blessing these, these folks. You're laying your hands on them with me. And Father, today in Jesus' name, we just thank you for each one of these families on this stage. We thank you for every precious little child on this stage today.
And Father, we do pray in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you that these little ones were formed in their mother's womb, that you knew them before the creation of the world, that you, Lord, are the one that have written their story. Their book already exists in heaven. We pray that they will live out every page, every day ordained for them, Lord, that no plans of the enemy will cut one of those days short, that we, we even call now the angels on assignment to help them live out their days and live out what's on the page so that their stories will redound to the praise of the Lord. And Father, we pray over each one of these families, over each marriage. Father, their homes will be filling stations filled with the love, with the faith, with the hope, with the joy of the Lord. It'll be just very, very natural for these kids to fall in love with you because you're honored in these homes. And so we pray blessing over each one of these parents, blessings over each family, and we give you all the thanks and praise today in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone agree with that prayer? said amen. Come on. Cheer these guys on. Thank you guys. I want you to, uh, I want you to stay standing. Maybe, uh, you know, in these days you're, you forearm bump the person next to you to say hi, and then just stay standing. And we're going to move into a time of worship today. Listen, I want you to receive this song that we begin with because it is the very prayer. I just prayed over these little ones. It is God's heart for you. Receive it today. <clears throat> Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the blessing of Jesus and that you've blessed us, your children, with every blessing in Christ. We praise you, Father.
Amen. You know, anytime I sing joy to the world, I always think of the night that Jesus was born and the angels went and appeared to the shepherds and says, I bring you good news that will be cause for great joy. Just thank the Lord for the joy that we have in Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Lord. Well, Jesus, we lift your name on high in this place. And we thank you for the joy that we have. Holy Spirit, we know that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the DNA of Jesus Christ living in us. So, Holy Spirit, I pray you would bring about fresh fruit in our lives again today. A fresh joy would rise up, Lord. That maybe where there's been sadness or despair or depression, that joy would rise up in our lives, Lord. Fresh, fresh joy, fresh peace, fresh strength over your people today. And Lord, as we get closer and closer to Christmas, may we never forget that Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. And we thank him for his joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Whether you're joining us in person or online, just want to say welcome. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. So great to have you with us this weekend. You know, as I got up this morning and headed downstairs to our kitchen, our girls were, both of our little girls were following me. We have this little Christmas tree on our kitchen countertop there that has these little magnetic ornaments that count down the days to Christmas. And as my daughter Ariana put up that 13th ornament and she counted the days down to Christmas, she said, only 12 sleeps left. Till Christmas. And uh, man, it just caught me again and said, holy cow, it is crazy to think that we are less than two weeks away from Christmas. We are so close. So make sure you get your Christmas shopping done. Make sure you get that online shopping done. Get those packages here in time for Christmas. But as we talk about Christmas, uh, many of you know, as we've been announcing over the last several weeks, we will not be having our regular Christmas production here on campus this year. But we are excited that we still will be having some sort of Christmas here at Northridge, except it will just be going out through WCIC and we'll be partnering with a TV station. So radio and TV. So radio, let's talk about that for a minute. That's 91.5 WCIC. We're partnering with them doing a Christmas carol sing-along. And I'm also doing a short devotional on hope using my best radio voice. This is John Rickner over the airwaves. Excited about that. I always wanted to be a radio slash TV kind of sportscaster guy. So that was kind of like my one opportunity talk about the Lord. It was awesome. So we're looking forward to that. And you can see the times where that's going to air. And I would just encourage you on one of those nights when it's airing, maybe hop in the car with your family, go check out some Christmas lights and turn on the Christmas carol sing along, have some fun with us. And then we'll also be airing last year's Christmas production on HOI, our local news channel, station 25 here in Peoria. Like I said, we'll be airing last year's Christmas production, and uh, it's going to be a great thing. So I want to encourage you, church, I want to remind you that Christmas is really, this is what we do, one of the biggest things we do here at Northwoods. If you were to go to out in the community and ask people, if you think of Northwoods Community Church, just give me one word that comes to mind. I think most people would say Christmas. We are known for the Christmas production. And whether you know it or not, all of us play a part every year in the Christmas production at Northwood. Some of us play a part through actively serving in the Christmas production. We play a part through our giving. We play, play, play a part through our prayers as we're praying for it. And some of us, we, we play a part through our invitations, inviting people to the Christmas production. And I just want to remind you to kind of stay in that mindset this year, church, that we all play a part, even though it's on WCIC and on TV. And the part that all of us play is that we can be praying for what God is going to do through it. Both times in the, in the radio and TV, there is going to be, we're going to be sharing the gospel. And so I want to encourage you to be praying that God would use radio and TV to reach many people for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, no one can come to me except that the Father who sent me draws them. And so let's be praying that our Father, our Heavenly Father, would be summoning people, drawing people to Jesus Christ as the gospel is presented 
through those different mediums this Christmas. So I want to encourage you this week, just be thinking about that, praying about that this week, and let's pray that God would bring many people to Jesus this Christmas season at Northwoods. And then December 27th, the last Sunday here in December, we will not have on-campus services. We will be all online on December 27th. Now I'm excited to be sharing a message that I believe God's put in my heart for 2021. And then we'll be back in the room. We'll be back in person on January 3rd as we kick off a brand new series called Hope Lives Here. And we get ready to kick off the fast. So get all your eating in now. Get ready. The fast is coming. And I want to encourage you as we lead up to the fast to also be praying and asking the Lord, how might you want me to engage in the fast this year? You know, I, I just shared this with the, the nine o'clock and I'll share it again here that last year, my wife and I were praying about having another child and uh, that hadn't, hadn't happened for a little while. And so we were praying about that. And it was during the fast that my wife came to me and said, you know what? I really felt like the Lord just told me we're going to have a son this year. And our son was just the one getting dedicated up here. We did have a son this year. And I don't want to, I share that not to tell you that if you fast, the Lord will give you a child. I don't know if that's good news or bad news for some of you, but that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that when we fast, it's not about what we get, but fasting is about drawing closer to the Lord. And how many know when you're drawing closer to the Lord, that's a little bit easier to hear his voice. And so maybe this year there's something you're saying, I need to hear God's voice on this. You know, one word from the Lord can change everything. And so you're here saying, I need to hear God's voice for a certain situation. I need him to speak into something. I would encourage you, to engage in the fast because there's something that happens during the fast when we cut out everything else that's competing for our attention. We cut out everything else and it's just like we're tuned in to the Lord's voice. And so I'm praying that God will be speaking to many of us this, this January and I want to encourage you to be praying about and asking the Lord, how do you want me to engage in the fast this year? And we will look forward to what he's going to do in January and 2021. And then lastly, just want to say thank you again for your continued faithful giving here at North. It's been a crazy year as we come to the end of it, but man, you guys have been faithful in your giving. And I always like to say it's our giving that fuels the growth of what God is doing through our church in this community and all around the world. And you better believe that God has been doing some incredible things through our church this year. As many of you have been a part of helping plant churches all over the world this year. We're, we're getting close to completely knocking out the debt here at Northwoods. And that money that normally went to a mortgage payment is going to go be releasing money towards planting churches globally and locally. And one of those churches this year that's, that's going to be planted in January, Tanner Smith up in the Quad Cities, is one of our first local church plants. So God has been doing some incredible things through our church. And much of it is made possible through our continued faithful giving. So thank you. And if you want to give, remember, you can give online at northwoods.church slash give. You can text to give 309-243-1550. You can give in the black boxes in the back. You can mail it in. And just remember, as you're coming up to end of your giving, if you want your giving to count towards the 2020 year, we'll just need to receive that by end of year. And maybe if you're here and say, I'd like to give assets or stocks or something of that nature, need help with that, just call our business office anytime before December 23rd, and we would love to help you with that. So thank you again. Can't say it enough for your continued faithful giving. Well, hey, that's it for me. We are going to continue to worship.
and the soul felt its worth. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come. Hallelujah. Hear the angels sing. Hallelujah. Hail the newborn King. Truly He taught us love for every man. His law is love and His gospel. Shall he pray? The slave runs free again, and in his name, all oppression shall cease. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has. Northwoods, has that helped you get your joy on already this morning? Isn't that good? And I want to, it's so good to see you guys today. Welcome to our online family and our other campuses. And I'm telling you, it does my heart good to just see some of the production numbers again. I've been inwardly grieving the uh, canceling uh, of our production this year. I was looking back at my uh, Everything in my journal has gone to pop this year because I had tours to Israel and everything that were in there had to be scribbled out and, and this type of thing. But I noticed this week, you know, it would be dress rehearsal, dress rehearsal, dress rehearsal, Wednesday coming, we'd be starting the production for the next number of days, you know. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, Lord, <laughs> I'm missing it. But just a touch on the weekend services has really helped me. And next week, uh, well, there'll be even more, so join us for that one. But as John said, be praying for our various broadcasts 
that many uh, people will respond to Jesus through the media, through TV, through radio, and for those who know him, that uh, it'll just be an opportunity for our hope or for our hearts to be filled with hope and joy. And then I want to also give you one other thing uh, to put on your calendar. Join us for the Teen Challenge virtual banquet. Uh, you know, they, they have their banquet every September or October. They couldn't do that this year. They were scheduled to be here with us uh, in August and had to cancel that. They had to cancel a lot of events. But we had the opportunity, and we're so grateful they're one of our partners. They're going to have a virtual banquet that'll be coming right off of this stage. And we were very, very glad to help them put that together. Mark it down. It's December 15th. And it's going to happen at 7 o'clock. You can just go to northwoods.online and you'll be able to catch up with the Teen Challenge Banquet, hear some of the singing, hear some of the testimonies. I have a little challenge there as well. And uh, again, we're, we're grateful. Be a part of the Teen Challenge Banquet. Well, long before my oldest son, John, and I, he gave me permission to share this with you today, but long before he was called to preached the gospel and was selected to be the next lead pastor of Northwoods, happening in 2022. It was December of 2006. He was a bit of a casual and confused college freshman at Toccoa Falls College in Toccoa, Georgia, or Toccoa Falls, Georgia. He, he knew he was there to play basketball, but other than that, he wasn't really sure about where he was going what he wanted to do or why he need, needed college to get him to where he didn't know he was going, you know? Uh, we were kind of asking that along with him, but uh, right before Christmas break that year, I had taken a one-way flight to Atlanta to see his final basketball game before the break to help him then get his car packed up and together we would drive the 12-hour trip back to uh, Peoria. Now, one of the assignments for each of the guys in the dorm before the break was to make sure their rooms were clean and in tip-top shape or to receive a fine of some kind. Now, you need to understand, moms, if you don't know this, a lot of guys at college pride themselves in living in the most squalid conditions imaginable. And I'm pretty sure John's room would have been in the running for top award had one been given. Well, I didn't, don't have an actual photo available, and I know we have some footage of this somewhere. I couldn't find it. So I thought, well, let's bring up something. This is close to what I walked into. I, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's what I walked into when I walked into his room. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, behind the door with the filthiest sink you'd ever seen, there was a two foot high trash can piled nearly six feet high all the way to the ceiling <laughs> with pizza boxes, fast food wrappers, empty two liter bottles. Guys, this is Christmas. I guarantee you there's stuff in there from September, you know. <laughs> and at the floor was a pit. It was littered with old socks, shoes, shirts, shorts, food, you name it. The worst was a jug with a little bit of curdled milk that they had tossed in a bucket in one of their closets and was now uh, giving off this foul-smelling odor, odor. And when I went to toss that out, I apparently interrupted a party of some fruit flies that had gathered to celebrate their good fortune. All I could say was, John, it's a good thing your mom's not here to see this. Because I said she'd be sick. In fact, we laughed today because when I showed a little video of this, I had a guy take a video of his room like 13 years ago for a message that we were doing. I actually had a mom email me and say, thank you, that released me from so much guilt that I was feeling because of my son's messy room. I said, John, way to go. All your squalor just help set another mom free. That's so awesome, you know. Now, while keeping their rooms clean is not a top priority for a lot of college guys, I've seen worse out of grown adults sometimes. I'm familiar with one situation where a, a wife's unacknowledged sickness in hoarding anything and everything and her husband's 
unwillingness to confront it had resulted in a house that was literally packed floor to ceiling with junk, bedrooms filled, living room filled. There was literally, literally nowhere to walk except to use a little path to the kitchen chairs or, or to the couch. And it, it, again, it was, some, it was no different than, than that right there. And I share this not to make fun of anybody, trust me. College students usually grow out of this phase. And John has. It's amazing. The guy's like a neat freak today. Remember a time he would, in, in high school, he'd dump his clothes right in the middle of the floor and just use them one by one as he needed them, right? And the only time he couldn't find a shirt one time, it was hanging in his closet. Like, <laughs> what the thought, you know? But see, he's grown out of that today. With hoarders, it's a, listen, it's a mental stronghold that needs help. See, what we don't want to do like we're fond of doing in our day, in our culture, so as not to hurt anybody's feelings, is to redefine as normal behavior something that is clearly abnormal. We all know it. We look at a room like that and go, "Uh uh-uh, I don't think so. We all go, think that's abnormal. But today, not so much. See, when we no longer have a basis for discerning normal from abnormal, then everything's normal, right? To each his own. You like clean, I like dirty. Who's to say what's best? I shared a few weeks ago the illustration of making myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Let's say I get to the fridge, open up that, you know, take the lid off that that jelly and and, and, uh, it has a funky looking green and gray hair kind of growing out of it and I know it doesn't look right. It's kind of, I think that's abnormal. And, and, but my response was, well, who am I to judge? And then spread that moldy stuff on my bread for a nice snack, right? And you'd say, Cal, that's sick. And today people go, stop judging me. You know, maybe it's something I like. It's good, you know? So that's indicative of how our world wants us to live today. Call everything normal and then no one has to admit to abnormal. Call a cluttered up, junked up house with newspapers piled from floor to ceiling normal and just assume people who don't live in such conditions, they're clean freaks. Because who's to judge, right? Everything is normal and nothing is abnormal. Now I want you to hang on to that because the Bible likens your heart as to a house where if Jesus, you've asked him into your life, he's living there. And so I want to ask you the question today about what's going on in the rooms in your house, what the rooms in your home look like. Are they clean or are they cluttered? Is there any place, it's the most important question I'm going to ask you today, is there any place in your heart where you've redefined abnormal and called it normal? And how do, you, how do we decide what is normal or what should be? Well, the Bible gives us a picture of normal when Jesus Christ is living in your heart. Galatians 5, and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, that's what the Spirit produces in you when Jesus is living in your heart. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a great list, but see, we're focusing in this series on the word joy. This is saying that when Jesus is living in your heart, joy ought to be the normal condition. And if it's not, it doesn't mean that Jesus isn't living there if, in fact, you've invited him in. It might be an indication that some hidden clutter is so mucking up your heart that it's now robbing you of joy. And friend, if that's the case, I want to challenge you today, don't accept that as normal. Agree with Jesus about what he says should be normal. Over the last few weeks, we've been discovering secrets to the joy God wants us to know as we dissect the lines of that popular Christmas chorus, joy to the world. The first week we learned we we can have joy because why the Lord has come. 
Joy comes as a result of choosing to focus on the good news in a bad news world. Last week, John looked at the line, let earth receive her king. And we discovered that joy is a result of our lives being now under new management. And praise God, some people last week surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Can you give him praise in the house for that? That's always the most important decision. But then the third line goes on, the line we're looking at today says, let every heart prepare him room. Let every heart prepare him room. Now, if you have received your king and you've said, Jesus, I invite you to come into my life to reign as my king and my savior, he is now in your life. And I remind you, when he comes in, he comes in not to just be resident, but to be president. We don't get the right when we say, I'm going to receive my king to say, well, now listen, in preparing you a room, I'm going to give you this little space here, and I want you to stay there and not mess with anything else in the house. It's not the way it works. I want you to look at what Ephesians 3 and verse 17 says. And the Living Bible actually captures this, the, the, exactly the, the uh, idea here. It says, and I pray, you know, now that Christ is in you, Okay, Paul is saying, I pray that Christ may be more and more at home. Like he'll feel more and more at home in your hearts. Living within you as you trust in him. Your job in preparing him room is to listen to anything he might say about any clutter, clutter that he finds there. Because guys, listen, if he's going to make himself at heart, or he's going to make himself at home in your heart, see, he, as president and not just resident, he is asking you for access to every room. Like, this is my house now. And your job is to say, okay, Lord, you can go anywhere you want. And if you find anything in any room that doesn't belong there because the king is now reigning in me, I give you permission to take it out. And so we're going to walk through a couple of rooms looking for clutter. See, here's the problem. If I allow clutter to go on in my life and call it normal, I'm not going to have joy. So let's look at a couple of rooms today. First, we're going to start with the attic. And this rep represents the place where old memories are stored. And of course, there, there are a lot of old memories that bring us joy when we remember them, the special vacations, the times when you felt extremely close to family and friends, fun times. I used to walk up in my mom's basement, or up, basement up in the attic, and there I would find, you know, we could see old Christmas ornaments, and the Christmas tree was stored there, and it brought back great memories. Some funny Christmas cards, but she had a lot of her photo albums there as well. You know, there's all kinds of memories. And a lot of them good. But we also know that the attic can easily become cluttered with painful memories and the cobwebs of resentment. So as we show Jesus around the attic, he would want to know if we're allowing one of the most significant joy robbers to reside in our attic. Here at the attic, Jesus wants to clean out the clutter of old resentments and hurts. And so he'd come to your attic today and say, do you have any old resentments or hurts that you need to get rid of? Well, I have a right to hang on. No, 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 it's robbing you of joy. Don't call it normal. I read an article several years ago, amazing, it's a true story, but a Christian man who received a highly unusual request one day. A dying man contacted him and asked, could you come visit me in the hospital? I want you to tell me about God and how I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, most of us would probably jump on an invitation like that. I mean, somebody practically begging us to, to lead them to Christ. This guy wasn't so sure. You understand the rest of the story, you'll know why. When he received this call, it stirred up some painful memories in the attic. He shares, the man who was asking me to come see him was the man who had had an affair with my wife, which had led to the breakup of our marriage. And though my wife 
and this man subsequently married and divorced also, the pain was still real for me. He said, it was like the ghost of an old injury. Whenever I thought of him, I remember that he was the reason my kids had to shuttle between two homes. He was the cause of tremendous grief in my life and family. Now here he was dying of lung cancer, days from a godless eternity, asking me of all people to help him. And of course in the flesh, the moment he got that, it was like, who cares if he goes to hell? But Jesus was living there. And so he said, yes, I'll come. Hung up the phone and then wrestled with it for a couple of days. Not really wanting to. But then he says, listen to this. I remembered that it wasn't about me and what I wanted. It was about God and what he desired from me as a servant of Christ. So I went to the hospital with the love of Jesus in my heart. And I told that man the good news that he could receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness if he put his faith in Christ alone. And with a lot of emotion and tears of joy, he opened his heart and prayed to receive God's forgiveness. He died three weeks later, but he spent those last three weeks of his life joyfully telling everybody about his newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Is that awesome or what? And the man who led him to Christ... He was released into a joy like he had never known before as he allowed Jesus to clean out the clutter of old resentments and hurts that had been stored in the attic of his memory. I wonder if some of more of us here today have some ghosts of old injuries cluttering up the attic in our hearts. Jesus doesn't tell you to deny the pain or pretend it didn't happen or that it didn't matter. It did. That's why it hurts. But he would ask you if you'd like to be free of your resentment and the pain that it's bringing to your life. He's ready to help you clean it up. That person who wounded you, who hurt you, who rejected you, that person needs forgiveness just like you and I needed. He needs God's forgiveness she needs your forgiveness. The word of God says in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, which means ill will towards someone. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Look at this, forgiving each other. How? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. You needed Christ's forgiveness, so does that person. Clean out the clutter and give it to him. And the only way you clean out the clutter of old wounds, listen, the only way you clean out the clutter of old wounds is through forgiveness. And this is not something you can do in your own strength. Jesus is living in you to help you forgive. Ask him to help you with it. Let him take you to the old wound. Ask him to help you have mercy on the offender. And then say, I'm going to give you, I, I should have put it up there today, but you, and maybe we'll put it out online or something. I, I want you to have the prayer. I, I've taken hundreds and hundreds of people through this prayer. And I've, I've seen people set free just through praying this prayer. And here's, how, here's what I have them do. In Jesus, in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, from my heart today, I choose to forgive, and we name the person, my mom, my dad, my teacher, you know, Jim, Mary, Nancy, whatever the name. I choose to forgive for, and then we list everything, like we're putting it in a box, all those things that hurt me. I put them in a box. I choose to forgive them for. In Jesus' name, now once we got them all in the box, and I ask him, Jesus, is everything in the box? Yep. Then I say, in Jesus' name, I place all of their sins and offenses against me under the blood of Christ. I now renounce the evil effects these sins have had on my life and any agreements I have made with them or lies I have believed because of them. I sometimes stop right there and say, name the lies. And then people say, in Jesus' name, I renounce the lie that, the lie that, the lie that, that I'm not loved, that I'm not good enough, that I'll never be good enough. On and on it goes, right? I renounce it in Jesus' name. And once we've done that, we say, now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for my resentment and bitterness against this person, right? I now surrender them to you, and I ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. And once we come there, we can say, now, Lord, where there used to be resentment and bitterness, would you fill that with joy? And he does. 
Just recently, I have seen Sarah, I've seen Stephanie, I've seen Tom released into joy as the clutter of that unforgiveness and bitterness was washed out. Margie, Margie just sent me a, a note that during the Freedom Weekend, she got absolutely cleaned out and filled with joy as they allowed Jesus to clean out the clutter of old wounds and memories through forgiveness. Let him go there with you. He just wants to release joy. That's the attic, okay? Now, let's, let's, go to the, let's go to the bedroom. See, the bedroom is usually a place in homes that's off limits to those outside the family, right? When you, you go to a person's home, you hang out in the family room, living room, kitchen. You don't go, hey, can we go look at your bedroom? <laughs> Jesus is living there. And he wants access but we understand the bedroom is a place of intimacy and, and personal secrets reserved for those who dwell there. And listen, if all is well in the bedroom, it's a place of deep rest. Love how my son said, and little daughter said, 12 sleeps till Christmas, all right? I love those deep rest. I love, I love those sleeps. Deep rest. However, the bedroom can easily become a place of deep unrest if it becomes a place of hidden secrets. So in preparing Jesus' room in our hearts, he'd like to visit the bedroom as well and ask us if we have any hidden secrets in our lives because he wants to clean out the clutter of hidden secrets. You keep hidden secrets, it'll rob you of joy. In the Bible, Adam and Eve sinned and what was their first response? Always they would run when they heard, they'd run to him when they heard God coming. This time, because they had sinned, what'd they do? Hide, he's coming. Where'd they learn to do that? King David committed adultery with Bathsheba. What's he do? Hold a news conference to let people know? No, he tries to hide it for nine months. We've all learned this pattern very well. It's been handed right down our family tree. If you've done something you're ashamed of, if you've done something for which you know you'd be toast if it were discovered, the, the, the word you hear is hide. Keep it secret. I mean, how many of you failed in some way and then held a press conference to announce it? If you had an affair with someone, you didn't go home and announce it. Hey, honey, got something to tell you today. I'm really sorry, but I had a rendezvous with someone at work. Politician has taken dirty money, been involved in corruption, or taken a bribe. They don't hold a press conference and say, hey, I want you guys to know what I did. You know, you're voting for me. I want you to know. No, they devise elaborate cover-up schemes. And likewise, when we're carrying a secret that we're afraid is going to come out, we often just cross our fingers and hope it will never see the light of day. Some of us are determined to carry our secrets to the grave. The trade-off is that we will never really know joy again. Because the private guilt of our secret sin will be robbing us every day. We'll never really feel close to God again because every time we're in his presence, we feel the shame and it just kind of drives us away from him. We can't, can't feel close. We might even end up with physical symptoms like David did, yet we can hardly imagine coming clean through confession for fear of the pain and the chaos it might create in our lives or maybe in the lives of others. So we hide. Now, guys, depending on the depth of the sin and the fallout it could have in our lives and the lives of others, we always need to ask who needs to know and why. That's a very, very important question. Not everybody needs to know my secret. But if it's something that's had negative effects on people around me that's damaged them, damaged me, whatever, there's some people that probably do need to know. So who needs to know and why? Here's my rule of thumb. If it's crippling your emotional, relational, spiritual, and physical world today, and that secret involves sin against other people that needs to be confessed and made right, then you need to surrender your reputation to Jesus and ask him to help you clean out the clutter. If you're not sure what to do about it, then have a Christian counselor help you. But God's word reminds us very clearly in James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins, i.e. your secrets, to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. I always say confessing it to God. He's not going to tell anybody. Confessing it to God, he forgives you. But sometimes you confess it to him so you can go on doing it and nobody else is going to know about it. Confessing to God brings forgiveness. Confessing to others brings healing. Why? Because now we're getting it out of the darkness and we're bringing it out into the light.
place of healing is bringing your sin into the light. One night a few years ago, I had the opportunity to pray for a young lady who was experiencing excruciating headaches. She would get these migraines that would just absolutely cripple her. She was having one that night. As we were talking about when they had started, she was able to trace them back to a broken time in her life in which she had engaged in secret sin. And she was ashamed. She had told no one. But that night she confessed to me a deeply embarrassing and painful secret she had carried for five years. And as she confessed that secret, as she released her shame to the Lord that night, you want to know something else? Incredibly, the headaches left. To my knowledge, they've never come back. See, it was the pain of a secret she was carrying in her emotional world that was creating the pain in her physical world. And not only did that all leave that night, she was released into joy. See, the bedroom in our hearts reminds us that we're only as sick as our secrets. You cannot allow secrets to clutter up your life and have joy at the same time. So Jesus comes to the bedroom in our hearts today, that secret chamber, and he asks us, have you got any clutter, any secret shame that needs to be cleaned out? Bring it into the light through confession and cleansing so your heart can be healed and released into joy. And then we move from the bedroom to the family room. Now, this can be a great place for the family, but it's also a place where a lot of us picked up some more clutter that robs our hearts of joy. A lot of times, it's in the family room that people will pick up one of the greatest joy robbers, what I call performance orientation. And maybe you pick some of that up in your family room. Jesus wants to clean out the clutter of performance orientation. What do I mean by that? Performance orientation occurs when a person does not receive enough unconditional love and affection as they're growing up. And then their heart takes in the message that only if you measure up to the standards around here will you be loved or will you belong. And since we all need love in order to live, then fear of failure and fear of rejection begin to rule our hearts. The result is either compliance... I'll do whatever I need to in order to gain approval and earn love. Or, for some people, it leads to rebellion. If I have to perform, I'm not performing at all. Now, if a person feels like they have to perform for love, they'll be filled with striving all their lives. They'll never be sure they've done enough to earn it and will always be measuring and judging how well they've done when real affection, some of you, I've known this one in my own life, when real affection or love does not come their way, what they refuse to believe it or when when, when it does come their way, they refuse to believe it or receive it because they think, you know, if they knew the truth about me and what I was really like, they wouldn't love me. And since being loved is equated with being good, every performance-oriented person fears discovery. They cannot let others see their flaws or sins for fear of rejection. This then locks them into playing roles while inwardly feeling more and more isolated. The longer they perform, the more subconscious behavior bubbles up. Things like anger, that one has to perform for love instead of being loved simply because they exist. Now, you, you might not know that's why your anger is there but that's what happens. Or it may be weariness and depression from all the striving and performing, pretending and posing, and yet feeling like it's never enough. Jesus walks into the family room with you and says, you ready to lay this stuff down? Because it'll wear you out and you won't have joy. Authors Paul and or John and Paul Sanford tell a story about a missionary lady who was sent home from the mission field because of an unrelenting state of depression. She had spent years preaching the gospel to a tribe of people, but deep down inside, at heart level, she had never really believed that God could love her. And she only felt good about herself if she was trying desperately to prove herself worthy of his love. That's even part of what led her to the mission field. During a prayer session with the Sanfords, it came out that at 16 years of age, she had had an affair and lost her virginity. Her performance-oriented character had prevented her from telling anyone 
because what are they going to think, right? She had tried to confess it in secret to Jesus and had striven to believe that, he, that, that she had been forgiven, but she had never been able to forgive herself, and she didn't see in her heart how anyone else could forgive her either, much less God. And in prayer, the Sanfords were ministering to her. She went back to that memory as if it was the day after she had done it, and she walked right up to Jesus and told him what she had done. And in her prayer session that day, she experienced the deep love of Jesus for her in a way she had never experienced it before. And as she did, her depression walked right out of the room. That was the day she truly came to understand the greatest word in the Bible, i.e. the word grace. Do you guys know what we talk about grace? You know what grace really is? Grace is God knowing the worst about you and loving and accepting you anyway. What a great word. It's not something you can earn. It's only something you can receive. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.16, listen, some of you need this today in the family room. Let us then approach the throne of what? Judgment? No, the throne of grace. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You've got a God who says to you, I love you with all my heart. You can't perform for me. Please come to my throne and let's talk about what we need to talk about. Amen? Come on. God doesn't say, perform for me and pretend to be perfect, and then you'll merit my grace and receive my love and acceptance. Rather, he says, come to me with all your faults and failures. Surrender them to my love and receive my grace. And guys, when his unconditional love and acceptance get into your heart, it'll free you from the performance trap. And the irony of ironies is that you will then perform better, not because you're trying to, but because your behavior is now the overflow of knowing the deep affection of God for you in your heart. Rooted in love, Ephesians 3 says, when Christ is dwelling there, may you be rooted in his love for you. When you're there, your performance will flow out of that, not out of an attempt to get love. See? This performance-oriented junk is a joy robber, and and if you've got any of that clutter in your family room, let, let God take you there today and surrender it to his grace. Okay, another room we got to look at, and that's the dining room. See, wherever we share meals together was, was meant to be associated with our warmest times of fellowship. It's the place of belonging, of feeling secure in knowing that we have a place at the table and a, a vital part in the family. It's a place where our sense of identity is formed. At the dining room table, Jesus will want you to know that you're secure in your identity, and he helps us to clean out the clutter of what I call identity confusion. He wants us to be very clear about who we are, that we are now valued members of his family, sons and daughters of the king. I believe it was former Kansas senator and 1996 Republican presidential nominee Bob Dole, remember that name? Who while visiting a nursing home one day sat down next to this elderly lady who just talked away seemingly oblivious to the famous man who was next to her. At one point, Bob leaned over to her and said, "Do, do you know who I am? And she said, "Uh, no, but if you'll go to the front desk, they'll be able to help you with that. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? (laughs) And I thought, you know, some of us just like that are looking for others to tell us who we are. Read this years ago, some relatively young grandparents who took two of their grandchildren to Marine World one day. Elijah was three at the time. His cousin Misha was five. They're in the hospital bed, sitting on the bed. They're watching a National Geographic documentary on television about a crocodile, and lizard, this type of thing. And when it was over, Misha looked at Elijah and said, let's play crocodiles and lizards. Elijah, the younger, was much stronger than, than Misha and not knowing what was coming. He says, okay. At which point, Misha said, I'll be the crocodile. You be the lizard. Elijah was fine with that, and at that point, they stood up on the bed, began to wrestle. Within a minute, Elijah had Misha pinned down on the mattress. Misha began to complain and said, you can't do that, Elijah. You're the lizard. I'm the crocodile. Elijah immediately stood up and said, well, what do lizards do? 
she said they lick things with their tongues like this. And then she demonstrated by licking his cheek. And he meekly goes, okay. It wasn't but a few seconds later that Misha had convinced him to lie down so she could get on top of him. And she's like, rah, rah. You know, she's, she's roaring like a trying to hold him down. Every time Elijah tried to push her off, she'd go, Elijah, you're a lizard. I'm a crocodile. You can't do that. You can only stick out your tongue. Finally, after about 10 minutes, a little voice came out from under Misha. Papa sitting over here watching us all take place. Little voice says, Papa, I don't want to play anymore. See, in adopting to the role that Misha wanted him to play, Elijah was stripped of his power and no longer found joy in the game. Can I tell you something, friends? That is an exact parable of what happens in life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And one of his key tactics is to convince you that he's the crocodile and you're the lizard and there's nothing you can do except let him hold you down and make life miserable for you. I ask you to let Jesus walk you through the rooms and show you the clutter and the enemy comes along and says, it's never going to be different for you. It ain't going to happen for you. He tries to lie to you and deceive you into thinking that you will, you know, just call normal what's abnormal because nothing can change. And then because we tend to act in accordance with who we believe we are, our identity lies ultimately get acted out in our behavior. We respond to our environment according to how we see ourselves. So Jesus comes to the dining room and through warm times of fellowship with us seeks to reaffirm our true identity and our sense of belonging in his family. He seeks to correct any lies we've chosen to believe and reminds us of what the Bible says. 1 John 4, 4, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. He reminds us that because he is living in us, we can claim the truth of Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. He would remind you that because he is living living in you. Your identity is now one of overcomer rather than underachiever. He wants you to know you are heir to his kingdom and all of the treasures of his kingdom are now yours and you are seated in the heavenlies far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, that you are the crocodile and not the lizard and that you have been given authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Can I hear an amen in here today? And here's what I'm telling you. Get your identity right and your behavior will flow out of that. That's the dining room table. Lord, got any identity confusion going on today? One more room, quickly. The bathroom. A lot of things happen in the bathroom. So some of us do our best reading, right? No, but... You think about the bathrooms, usually the place where you take your shower, you know, this type of thing. But I'm using it today to call it the get ready room because I'm going to bet you got your double sink there or whatever it is in your house. Every bathroom I've ever been in has a big old sink. And what's above the sink? A mirror that tells you, am I good to go? I can tell a lot of you spent some time in front of that mirror today before you came here. There's a few of you, I'm wondering a little bit. Huh? <laughs> And Jesus will walk you to that mirror today. Think of the mirror where you get ready. Jesus would walk you to that mirror today and he has a couple of questions he wants you to answer. Question. Is that a friendly or unfriendly face looking back at you? Do you like what you see? And what is that person in the mirror telling you about yourself? And Jesus would ask, are those messages consistent with my truth? And this is so important because you cannot live with self-sabotaging messages and be a joyful person. Thus, Jesus wants to clean out the clutter of self-sabotage. He wants to kick out the self-deprecating messages that rob you of your joy and replace them with his truth and how he feels about you. There's a doctor named uh, Dr. Daniel G. Amen. I, I love that word. It's just, amen. I'm reading his stuff. I go, amen, amen, amen. I don't know whether he's a believer, but everything he's talking about comes straight out of the Bible. I don't know if he knows it. 
He's a clinical neuroscientist. In his seminars, he explains how every thought you have sends an electric signal to your brain that can be recorded, analyzed, and visualized on a nuclear brain scan. They can actually look at your thoughts in your brain and what it's doing to you. He concludes, teaching yourself to control and direct your thoughts in a positive way is one of the most effective ways to feel better. Wow, that that sounds like be transformed by the renewing of your mind. (laughs) Dr. Amen strongly suggests that allowing critical, blaming, condemning, anxious thoughts to run rampant in your brain is simply polluting your body. He says every cell in your body is affected by every thought you have. He refers to negative thoughts and patterns as ants. Think of little ants screwing around. And they're called automatic negative thoughts. He not only encourages you to talk back to the ants, but to understand that these thoughts don't always tell the truth. In fact, at times they will even lie to you. So in in your get ready room, Jesus would have you look in that mirror and he would ask whether you're allowing some ants just to run around in the room. And if you are, they're going to rob you of joy. You need to get rid of them. And how do we we talk back and get rid of those ants? Well, God's word gives us the grid. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And saying that, he is telling you, you can think the right thoughts. You can throw out the wrong thoughts. You have a responsibility to do that. And Jesus is dwelling in your house to empower you to do that. And I remind you, nowhere does the Bible say, oh, and by the way, when you think about yourself, this list doesn't apply. It's most important that you apply this list when you're thinking about yourself. True, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Is that how you think about yourself? You need to regularly affirm who you are in Christ. You need to catch yourself when the ants are crawling around in your brain and talk back to those negative thoughts with God's truth. I am more than a conqueror. I am a child of God. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm a victor and not a victim. Stop on those ants or they will rob you of your joy. And so we hear that line, let every heart prepare him room. When Jesus comes in, he wants to help you clean up the clutter in your heart that may be robbing of you joy. Because listen to me, friend, joy is your inheritance as his child. Joy is to be your new normal. Don't settle for anything less. The Bible reminds us in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Man, life is hard enough. 2020 has been hard enough. Joy is what God gives to keep you strong. So folks, pursue joy, protect joy, and promote joy in every room of your house. Let Jesus know that he can have full and complete access to every room in your heart and that you're ready to clean out any clutter that may be robbing you of joy. If you have redefined normal or abnormal and called it normal, you say in Jesus' name, no more. I am going for joy. Amen. Come on, stand on your feet. We're going to make our declaration today. We're going to make our declaration because guys, this is powerful. You, one of the things I want to teach you, 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 you sit with Jesus, go through the rooms that I gave you today and any other rooms that he wants to go into, but you can make your declaration even while you're doing that. I'm going to shout it out. You shout it back to me. Here we go. Are you ready? In Jesus' name, name, I renounce renounce all clutter clutter in my life, life. and I claim his joy. I I believe and declare declare the joy of the Lord Lord is my strength. strength. In Jesus' name, name. Amen. amen. Now you go out in that joy this week, guys. Go out in that joy this week. And let that joy reside in your heart. If you need prayer for anything, you come on down and we'll pray with you. Man, I look forward to seeing you back next week. We're going to celebrate some more. All right? God bless you guys.
Those of you watching online today, thank you for joining us. So glad that you could be with us, and I pray that joy will be your new normal. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. Don't let the enemy rob you of it, all right? Prepare him room. Let him walk through the rooms and clear out the clutter, and joy will be what comes. God bless you guys. Hope to see you back next week.